Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mining Now. I am your host, Jared Downey. Joining me is Gaudi Molina. Hello, Gaudi. How are you? Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. And it is a good day because we have mining technology. You're already laughing at me. No, I'm, you I'm waiting. You laughed at me when I walked you, into you the had... studio this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even do anything. <laughs> you made you like gave this pause. I was just kind of waiting. I'm like, is he gonna say why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm getting through there. Speak slow sometimes, you know. Um, we have had so much mining technology right, yeah. lately. It has been a while since we've had an operating mine on the show. So today we have Silver Corp Metals. We've got their vice president, Lon Shaver, on the show. They are a Canadian mining company with uh, mining operations in China. Lots to cover. We're going to cover um, the company, the operations, some of their quarterlies, um, even some of the cultural, you know, things like the Chinese New Year's. You'll see on their charts and mm -hmm. things like that, how that affects stuff. And it's we got a lot to cover before we can do any of that, Gowdy. Yeah. I'm going to pause again. It's time for our sponsors. <laughs> That was a great pause. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, let's start off with Cal Tire Mining Tire Group. Whatever your goal is reducing costs, improving uptime, or fulfilling sustainability commitments, Cal Tire's Mining Tire Group has proven solutions to help you reach your targets. With proactive planning, tire management innovation, and highly trained team members at Cal Tire, they believe you can expect more at every stage of a tire's life. To learn more, you can visit them at caltiremining.com or email them at info at caltire dot com. Next up, we also have Fuller Brothers. Fuller Brothers Inc. has over 59 years of tire industry experience as a world's leader in providing non-hazardous, non-toxic products that reduce tire management costs for a diverse range of customers. They acknowledge formula developer, developers of the globally recognized tire life. Fuller Brothers also produces uh, other quality products such as PSF Plus, PSF, Lubesit, Tire Cream, Dripless Tire Paint, Omega Tire Repair System, as well as select tire service tools and tire painting equipment. Um, for more information, you can visit them at fullerbros.com. Fuller Brothers, we have the inside covered. And of course, we've got Savanai Equipment. Savanai Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from plaster to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. You can visit them at SavanaiEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. And we also have CIM, the 2022 edition of the Maintenance, Engineering, and Reliability Mine Operators Conference, or MIMO, is coming to Sudbury and the world in February. It's coming in a hybrid format. That means all of the conference programming, including networking events and the trade show, will be available to attendees in the host city of Sudbury, and the program will also be online, so virtual attendees will have access to all technical presentations and keynotes. The registration is now open, so you definitely have to go and register. Um, there's more details on MIMO and other upcoming CIM events at CIM.org. And last but not least, we've got Fenner Dunlop. Monitoring the health of your steel cord conveyor belts has never been easier. Powered by Eagle Eye, Fenner Dunlop, Dunlop's Bird's Eye identifies potential belt issues before they have the opportunity to create the need for larger, more time intensive and expensive action. Log in from your smartphone, tablet or computer to access all your steel cord belts from one screen. Your bird's eye subscription also includes online remote, remote service and call center support, on demand web reports and yearly review of your system's performance. You can visit them at FennerDunlopAmericas.com for more information. And we're good. Thank you, Gaddy. I'm going to say, you know, I never fill out surveys, but I filled out one from CIM, uh, just their mining 4.0, because, and I was just trying to like putting in comments, like, please keep doing the hybrid. Yeah. <laughs> because for me, yeah. I love going to live events. I mean, we started our show on the CIM floor. There's nothing right. can compare, but sometimes you just can't get to them. I know. It's, it's so it's, nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So as the live events are coming back, and I'm sure they're going to be come back in full force because everybody wants to get out. It's going to be nice <laughs> if you still can't packed, make it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Standing room only. Okay. <laughs> Lon, welcome to the show. I am, I, I am very excited to have you on. As you heard, we have, I mean, well, <laughs> you were in there listening to all of our sponsors. You, uh, you know, a lot of the companies who are on the show, um, but there's, there's something special about actually getting to talk to an op a mine that has operations, 
So thanks for coming on the show. Good to have you here. Thanks, Jared. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, let's let's kick off with with Silver Corps just as a, a setup because it's a little bit of a unique company. Um, you know, I to be completely honest, if you said a Canadian mining company, the first thought that comes to my mind is not okay. They've got they probably have operations in China, but that's exactly the setup for Silver Corp. So can you sort of lay out uh, the company, uh, sort of that bird's eye view? Yeah, sure. So yeah, well, I mean, we are, Silver Corp is a Canadian company. And what does make us different is that our operating mines are in China. And uh, we have two uh, operations currently in China. There's our flagship uh, Ying Mining District, which uh, really is what uh, was the foundation that built the, built the company. And we have another mine operating, uh, and that's in Henan province. And then in the south of the country, in Guangdong province, we have another mine called the GC mine. Uh, that's uh, our other mine, uh, mining operation. Uh, both the mines uh, produce basically the same uh, product, which is um, concentrates. Um, they, uh, they produce uh, lead concentrates that contain the, the bulk of the silver that we produce. And they also generate uh, zinc concentrates. And, and all of those concentrates are, are uh, treated uh, domestically within China. What sort of is there sort of an average production that these these put put out or an expectation of what these uh, do, do you com, do you combine production or how do you break that? I'm sorry, I said at the beginning of the show I'm going to ask some pretty lame in questions, but how do you measure the production? Uh, do you combine them or is it a separate thing? Yeah, I mean we, we would um, uh, given that the majority of our revenues are, are silver, um, we certainly highlight the fact that um, since uh, since we began production, we produced about 79 million ounces of silver. Wow. Current run rate is between six, uh, six and a half a million ounces a year. And um, since the, the mines began, uh, over a billion pounds of lead zinc with sort of roughly 90, 90 to 95 million pounds of uh, lead zinc a, a year. Wow. I want to just kind of, you know, because I think it's important to have context of a company, um, you know, especially one that's operating, you know, on, on two separate continents and, and just the whole setup. Can you, can you kind of take us back to even the, you know, who the founder is, how, how the sort of the setup of, you know, being a Canadian company with operations in China, how that all came to be? Yeah, I mean, our uh, chairman and CEO, Ri Feng, is a, um, uh, a Chinese geologist who did his early training in China. And he actually came to Canada to do his PhD uh, in geology at the University of uh, Saskatchewan. And while he was here, he fell in love with, uh, with the country and fell in love with the, the uh, legacy of the Canadian mining greats. And uh, so when he uh, finished his, his degree and set out uh, um, you know, looking for what to do next, he, he really had in his mind that he wanted to uh, found and create a uh, large, vibrant um, uh, mining company really along the, uh, the, the lines of those, those Canadian greats uh, that I mentioned. And uh, he started the company, he, he based himself in, in Vancouver, started the company by taking control of, of a shell and then look for assets that uh, would make sense to put in it. And, and his original networks is what led him to go back to look at some, some of these projects in China. And that's really where the, the foundation of the company began. It's always kind of fascinating. I mean, obviously you can't speak for him, but it's always sort of fascinating to me that jump from that exploration stage, you know, the, the, geologist, the, the geologist mindset towards the actual production mindset. So this is obviously someone who, Again, I realize you can't speak for him, but but you've obviously worked with him. That he, he's able to sort of uh, carry both mindsets, which is a little bit unique, actually. Yeah, no, he, he's he's a geologist that looks at uh, the merits of a deposit from a geology standpoint, but really looking at it from from the the facts uh, or the, the the factors can this deposit make for a viable, profitable mining opportunity? And you know, unlike some projects which might have long, long uh, Time frames to get to production, uh, large uh, capital um, investments required. And he's really been uh, championing, you know, what are those projects that have high margins that you can get into production quickly and start to generate cash flow? Because I think ultimately the view is mining, um, uh, like any other business, should be focused on financial returns. So, with these mines, when they, when both mines, would the was the already set up or was this was this right from greenfield was no it was right from greenfield oh wow and, and so really it was it was bootstrapped and so our flagship mining district really was uh, a collection of deposits 
um, some, some veins that people knew of. Some people knew that they had some high grades, but really people couldn't sort of crack the code to figure out how to get an, uh, an economic operation going. And, and he had the vision to see how it could. And uh, really that uh, mining operation was started with a, a $5 million uh, investment uh, initially. And uh, really all the other um, developments in the company have been delivered from cash flow that started in, in that early production. And uh, the Ying Mining District is now uh, delivered uh, profits to shareholders of approximately 500 million after that initial wow. five million dollar investment wow so it was a bit of a different approach rather than this I, I just had a conversation um with someone they were talking a little bit about the australian approach which is a little more like scale you know start smaller scale up is that is this a similar i mean five million is not a, a huge investment to then get to a pro uh, you know a production of this scale so there must have been a, a lot of scaling up process that happened over the years then. Yeah, there's been scaling up in, in terms of uh, uh, adding more access, adding more mines, um, uh, building more equipment, adding uh, milling facilities. We have two two mills that process the uh, the ore uh, from the seven mines on the Ying Mining District. So yeah, this was really something that's been built over time, as well as delivering returns back to um, the uh, corporate head office. Well. Yeah, it's um. Can, can we go into a little bit on the, the going back to the uh, you know the the asset quality and and I have to say um probably I'm gonna guess 30, 30 or forty percent of people listening are probably experts in, in understanding. But can you sort of break it down in, in layman's terms a little bit and then and then you know feel free to go a little more technical of just unpacking the you know you seventy nine million ounces of silver over fifteen years. Can you sort of break down? that asset quality from, you know, from a production standpoint and things like that? Yeah, I'd say the, the first part begins off of grade. So our, our mines tend to be uh, quite high grade, but then the fact that they're narrow has required a, a, a specific approach to the mining method. And then also given the number of people involved, uh, a high degree of attention on process and management, um, bringing in uh, technology to help organize people, help to automate tasks, so, so that's really been the the driving force behind what have been the, the high margins and and the fact that we've had the ability uh, to uh, on a fairly cost efficient basis explore uh, the Ying Mining District um, in addition to having that that production rate uh, that cost profile we still have a, a quite a long uh, mine life ahead of us based off of our uh, proven and probable reserves. When you say a billion pounds uh, of lead and zinc, in my mind, that seems like a lot. Is that a lot? <laughs> like, I, I don't really have a comparison to it. Um, how much production is that? Well, I, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a, a big number, and that's over a 14-year life. But I guess it's important to note that you know, when you're looking at the base metals, you know, those are bigger. They're not the bulk commodities like iron ore, right. uh, but certainly the... the um, the, the uh, quantities are greater than that than you'd see in a a, uh, um, a gold or silver operation. Well, you said about you said about that lower cost, you know, things like automation. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Because it's it's a topic that comes out, and a lot of times what happens on our show is that it's somebody that's you know we just had a a, a company on recently that was automating the haul trucks. So we see it sort of in this narrow stream or sensors for the, you know, uh, the blast or things like that. Can you sort of give us the, the look of it as an actual mine operator, that, that automation and then what that actually does for the efficiency of the mine and, and probably safety as well, I would assume? Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, as, as you've touched on, there's certain areas of automation. For example, you know, we've gone through a process of automating our mills. So that's dropped the, uh, the head count in terms of people in the mill. And it's meant that a lot of the information that's collected from the different equipment to optimize rates of uh, optimize reagent addition, and that's all being handled, um, you know, using computers. And there's other elements where that can be added in terms of uh, mine dewatering and looking at things. But but I think more fundamentally, like what we've been looking at is the digitization of our mining uh, activities, and that really looks at from sort of cradle to grave, what are the activities that are done. Uh, from the, the beginning to the end, and how can you uh, analyze those process flows and put them into something that's a formalized system. So 
uh, our, our company's been uh, a pioneer in doing that and developed in-house a uh, an in-house management tool called Enterprise Blog. And so, as an example, that's a way of looking and saying, okay, well, if we're mining these soaps, you know, how do these soaps get assigned? What's the next step? All right, well, geologists need to get in there and delineate where the the actual ore body is in these soaps. Where should the holes be drilled? Let's get that marked. Let's get that tagged. Uh, photos posted to our, our system. Once that's been designated as ready, the system then assigns that scope to a mining crew. They know that it's ready. They know what, the, what comes next. They show up um, when they arrive on site. It's very clear what they need to do. Uh, they carry out their activities. That gets posted back to the system. And so really, you're, you're able to connect the dots and, and have the information shared. And so that certainly helps from a um, from a process standpoint. Mm. But but the other thing that's that's important is is just looking at uh, health and safety monitoring as an example. You know we have requirements to monitor uh, for certain things like carbon monoxide uh, within the, the mining area. So a technician who's in charge of that is assigned to visit certain spots within the mines at certain scheduled times, uh, take readings, and post those. And so with this system, you know, not only are we able to uh, ensure that these readings are taken on a timely basis to make sure we're in, we're in compliance, uh, we're generating a database that can improve we're doing the right thing. But if ever there was to be something that was out of spec, right away the system would flag that and alert and we could take the necessary action to uh, fix it before it became a bigger problem. You know, one thing I was wondering, and uh, again, I've got to have this conversation from a very narrow uh, POV, but now when you're implementing these systems into an, a major operation, I mean, it's, I, I've never been in your position, so I, I don't actually know what it would take. You know, I remember I've done some, uh, some uh, an inventory management system. I, to this day, I don't know how I figured out how to do it, but um, for electrical equipment and just figuring out that system. I mean, it was, a, an, and just coordinating that and getting other people on board. I mean, it was a, a really big challenge. What is that like when you're in an operation, you know, you're on two separate sites, you know, your Canadian offices with operations in China and you're trying to coordinate all this. I'm sure there's some language um, barriers as well and all that. Even choosing what system to put in place. I mean, what is that? What is that process? Well, yeah, it's definitely a, um... Uh, a high degree of investment and involvement by our management team. Mm. And, you know, just to clarify, I mean, we, we also have a management team and a, and a operations head office in Beijing that oversees both, uh, both mining sites right. and provides support. But yes, there, there's a lot of people on site, a lot of work that's um, put into this, a lot of time analyzing and then uh, testing these systems. So it, it is a lot of work. Yeah, I would. Uh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall for some of that implementation because, like I said, I've done it at a small scale, and uh, doing it at a large scale, like your company's done, amazing stuff. Um, okay, let's go into the. I want to get into a little bit about the, you know, the, you know, you know, using free cash flow besides equity markets, you know, things like that, which is some interesting stuff that Silver Corp has done. Um, but before that, I wanted to sort of go into the the existing resources. Um, I'm seeing on here. There's these. Again, I'm going to get you to break down these charts because I'm not an expert on it. I've got I've got two charts here that I want to look at: uh, the growing reserves and resources for the silver, and the growing reserves and resources for the lead and zinc. Can you unpack that a little bit of what those two charts, what we're seeing here? Yeah, I mean that's just showing that um, over time, uh, despite the fact that we've been actively mining, uh, the efforts that have been put into exploration have identified um, additional resources and reserves. And, and earlier on, I, I stated we have long mine lives. Yeah. Um, so at the Ying Mining District, as an example, uh, based on the work we've done in the last, last um, uh, reports that we've published, uh, we have a 20-year mine life based off of reserves. And uh, so, so that's quite a long runway, and in particular yeah. for an underground mine. Um, a, a quick question. I just want to talk about like the numbers of the reserves and that, but it, just another little sidebar question on the technology. With these reserves you're finding, you'll get into the numbers here, is with the new technology over the last, let's say 15 years, um, has that allowed for the reserves you're finding to be more, um, more valuable or, or easy to, easier to identify? Like, 
30 years ago, 40 years ago, with these saved reserves as been identified as as valuable as they are now, just based on the technology that we, we have today? Well, I, I'd say the uh, technology is, is kind of a, a way to address um, um, what would otherwise be, you know, cost pressure. Mm. Uh, so in, in China, like everywhere else, you know, things like labor costs are going up. So to the extent that we can um, um, manage those costs with technology, you know, that helps us stay ahead of the game and keep those margins. Uh, with the, the, what the, the technology also allows us to do is, in terms of mining more efficiently, to allow us to focus on higher grades. And uh, that means that for each you know, uh, amount of work that we're doing to drill, blast, you know, muck, truck, and mill that, that ton of rock, which has the, the metals in it, you know, that we're doing it on rock that's higher grade. Yeah. So generating more metal per ton of, of rock that we're actually uh, treating. So, so that's a little bit of, of how the technology, you know, has helped us uh, as an operation. Can you, can you unpack the, the numbers a little bit about these, uh, these reserves and resources that you have? Yeah, so, so off of our most recent technical reports, um, we've got 114 million ounces of uh, silver approximately in the proven and probable reserve category. And again, I mentioned that in context of our run rate of between six and six and a half million ounces that we've been uh, consistently generating over the last five to six years. Uh, on top of that, uh, there would be men, uh, measured and indicated resources, which um, is about 211. Um, and that is actually, you know, it does include the reserves uh, in the way that those numbers are presented. But on top of that, we also have inferred resources, and that's around 150 uh, million ounces of silver. The, um, I want to go into now um, the, the financial performance, because in, you sort of laid it out nicely the you know the the production the reserves a little bit of the history and you you mentioned you know uh you know that five million um when it started silver corp and i i hope i'm getting this right they're not a company that went to the equity markets they actually have have operated on free cash flow is that right because that that's not that common yeah, yeah, we, we're we're very proud of the fact that we haven't come to the equity markets and uh, diluted our shareholders in uh, at least uh, like the last equity financing was in 2010, and that was more for looking at acquisitions. Uh, but even in the lean years, uh, when silver prices weren't at the levels they are today, uh, our uh, operations were able to generate positive cash flow uh, and put cash on the balance sheet, which uh, not a lot of companies were able to say the same thing. Now, when you say a lot of companies, and this is, I've been looking forward to asking this, asking this question. When you say not a lot of companies, have companies chose, have companies been forced to do it? And um, so they really had no choice where Silver Corp was in a position to not have to, or is it a strategy that companies have used that, that Silver Corp decide, no, this, this using this cash flow uh, approach is, is better? Well, I, I'd say there's a bit of both in, in, in terms of answering that question. Uh, to some degree, companies have had to come to the equity markets uh, to raise the capital to invest and reinvest in their operations. So, you know, when we talked earlier about the fact that uh, that $5 million was the only amount that was ever invested and all the other um, uh, construction costs have been covered from cash flow, uh, our peers can't say the same thing. So, so there's many companies that have had to um, raise equity money to put more money into the operation, whereas we haven't. Uh, the other thing that some of our peer companies have done is issued a lot of stock either in an acquisition or to fund an acquisition. Yeah. And in many cases, those acquisitions haven't lived up to expectations. Right. So you've increased the pool of stock out there, but you haven't generated the business returns uh, to justify it. Yeah, and then there's and and with this, the shareholders are actually they're actually keep holding on to their stock. This is not like I'm again looking at um, you know steady shares outstanding and, and things like that. Was that is it ever like in those lean years though? Was was it ever a discussion or was this was this almost like company culture and no this this is how we do it. Um, I, I'd say there's an openness to issue if we saw a great opportunity, but. Um, um, uh, in, in contrary to, to the to the question, if anything, uh, Silver Corp has a history of doing share buybacks. Right. And that was a case of looking and saying, well, we, we don't think the, the share price reflects the value of our business, mm. which is profitable, which is generating positive free cash flow. 
And if the market isn't uh, recognizing that, well, then you know we can um, actually take some shares out of the market through through buybacks. But uh, I, I think the you know the key element is is sort of through the the last seven years, which really shows a lot of the the um, the downturn that the, the mining market has has suffered uh, until the until just very recently, the last couple of years. You know, through that very lean period, uh, Silver Corp was able to generate that positive cash margin. And uh, and meet its obligations uh, through operations. Yeah, the the buybacks when the shares are undervalued. That's that's music for for a sort of a value investor approach. That's music to your ears. <laughs> um, the uh, okay, I want to talk. I want to bring up another chart here, and I noticed some drops. And I've got a note here because we talked about it off screen. And I wanted to talk about the the quarterly the quarterly net income. There's a positive quarterly net income, but then there's these drops in the quarter. And I think that correlates with the Chinese New Year and that sort of thing. So that was interesting just from, you know, from the numbers, it's interesting, but also from culturally, it's interesting. So I wanted to, I couldn't uh, do this interview without highlighting that because I, I, I saw the graph on here and I wanted to unpack it. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look at the, the net income, so that's accounting earnings, those have been consistently positive on a quarterly basis over the last seven plus years. Um, and overall, on an annual basis, our free cash flow has been uh, positive and quite strong over that same time frame. But within the years, the first quarter is always a soft quarter from a free cash flow standpoint, and that's because of Chinese New Year. And uh, uh, at a minimum, the operations are shut uh, down for a two-week period when basically the, the entire country goes on holidays. A lot of the workers go back to home uh, to visit family. So in that quarter, there's a bit of a ramp down, there's a shutdown and a ramp up phase. And that uh, combined with um, some you know, working capital and making some catch up and bonus payments is why that quarter is always the softest from a free cash flow standpoint. But we make up for it as our numbers uh, show uh, in the, uh, the, the rest of the year. Yeah, you know, and then just just to build on that, you know, that's these these little things. And if I just looked at that, I go, "What is? Why does that happen every time?" <laughs> and I'm just, in, you know, because you get to live sort of in both worlds, which you know, someone like myself, I don't. Um, you know, culturally, what what are you know what are some other differences, or or what are some of the same things, or you know, culturally as a company that sort of brings it all together for you um, that you see, you know, again the, with the current setup. Well, I'd say the the um, the the benefit of, of working at uh, Silver Corp is having that uh, that access to what I call uh, the Chinese intelligence, and and you know, given the fact that, that China is so instrumental in the world economy in terms of producing so many goods, that when you know you see sh- slowdowns in certain areas or things picking up, mm. it, it tends to sort of predict what might happen in the rest of the world after that, and. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, in terms of uh, um, the, the case of, of seeing things like labor costs uh, go up, you know, we, we start to see that and, and see challenges in, in, uh, in China with respect to finding more, more workers. Well, you know, guess what? Look around the world and that's what everybody else is facing right now. Right. And that's why everyone's talking about inflationary pressures and, and some of the supply chain uh, challenges. So I'd say that uh, given what we have, we've got a bit of a front uh, front row seat to see some of these factors playing out. Yeah, you know, I just I just released a poll yesterday um, about you know what what industries um, I th- people thought would be affected most by the supply chain, and I I can say I've never had a poll that has got that much engagement on it. I mean, it was <laughs> just everybody is piling in on it. Um, so it's a huge issue that everybody's watching. Um, going into sort of that further expansion part, um, can you talk a little bit about the the exploration side of thing? I mean, you, you, you know, you're talking about the reserves, and is there a pretty robust exploration program um, around Silver Corp as well? Yeah, we've um, going back to really the the spring of 2020, we've reinvigorated our uh, our programs and expanded them. Um, for two reasons, and, and this is mostly focused at Ying, but also to a lesser degree at the, the GC mine. But at Ying, we've got over 70 rigs uh, drilling uh, currently, uh, and that's across the seven different mining areas that we're currently operating. In. And uh, really, there's two main focuses. Um, one is to look at finding more of the traditional high-grade silver lead zinc mineralization. 
and really trying to find higher grades and also material that's close to our existing development. And, and the real reason for that is, is that the more of that that we find, um, we get uh, those higher grades and we also get to bring it into production with less development costs. So that's, that's one element of the drill program. Uh, but the other element is actually looking at something that we've uh, recently uncovered. And that is, you know, Ying, in terms of our minds, uh, has historically generated some splashy numbers in terms of gold results. Uh, but it's never been quite reconciled. Where did this gold come from? And the focus really has just been on, on mining these silver lead zinc veins. Um, in 2020, we, we had what we call a bit of a, of a discovery within our existing mines of a structure that we think is the host for that gold mineralization. Mm. And so we're, uh, we're really putting a lot of effort into identifying uh, where it is, how much of it is there, and can it be uh, mined and uh, add to our production. So again, going back to a, a layman question, to me, 70 uh, drill rigs, that seems like a I mean, that seems like a heavy drilling program in, in comparison to other other operations I've, I've talked about. So is, is that, that's just me, that is a lot of drills to have. It, it, it is, it is. It's a lot of drills and a lot of meters. And I think, you know, coming back to your, your earlier question, um, it's because of that management process and systems that we have in place that we're able to manage uh, that level of activity and the amount of information that's being generated by that. Yeah, I mean, it must just be staggering because, and it's going through all these. Uh, so, like, at what point, uh, just a little technical question, like, at what point do you get the information to start? Because it has to go through, you know, all these, you've got 70 drills, they're all, they're all taking samples, and then it gets, you know, looked at and goes through and through. When do you start looking at that? What the, the activity of those, you know, what's the sort of the final result of what you get to look at? Yeah, I mean, what we get to see is really what the what the market gets to see, which is a collection. Because um, we're not doing it just a drill hole by drill hole. While we have some some really exciting highlights for for a company like ours, some of those highlight numbers don't necessarily mean a lot. Um, but when we've got a package of results and uh, we can compile them in and put them out and hopefully have some context, is when we see them. And and really. Um, you know, the, the, the process here is to get those drills, generate that data, put it together, and then the significance will be when people then can sit down and run the calculations to say, okay, all right, well, we've been mining, so that's been reducing our reserve and resource base, but now we've been drilling. What do the results of the drilling mean in terms of new additions to the reserve and resource base? Let's wrap a calculation around that. Let's put that out so that the market can understand it. And in some cases, that might mean, well, is there an adjustment to the mining plan mm. based on what, uh, how much material, the grade we're expecting to generate, or, or as I mentioned, if we are able to uh, produce the ores from these gold bearing zones, uh, you know, we're looking to uh, report on some gold production here in the future. I, I feel like you could do a, just a full, well, definitely could do a full interview on just reviewing that type of data and how it's all compiled. It's, it's uh I never know what interests the audience. For me, I find that stuff very interesting. Um, but for in the in the interest of time, I also want to pivot into what about global activity? Is this you know are these two mines you operation? You got seventy drills. Is that where Silver Corp is looking to keep going, or are is there or there investments in other mines or expansions and acquisitions and that type of thing? Well, th that is a key element of our of our growth strategy, and so within our existing claims, we have uh, opportunity to grow, and that's why we are drilling. Uh, we've identified some other satellite deposits, and we've acquired two of them uh, that we're looking to bring in and and to factor in this growth from the, that district. We're looking at expanding our processing facilities. This is all the same area, then. All, all in the same area. Um, but at the same time, uh, we've got a very active review program looking elsewhere in China, but then also around the world, looking at uh, silver and then also gold projects. Oh, okay. So you're actually looking outside. You're completely looking outside of China or, or how? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So now what about, um, so are you, are, is Silver Corp actually investing in other companies? Uh, you know, like with, with shares in, in other operations, like even outside of China and things like that? Yeah, I mean, our, our global project review program leads us to looking at lots of different things around the world. In some cases, that could identify targets that uh, would be uh, for acquisition. Uh, so let's acquire it, bring it into the Silver Corp fold 100%, and 
uh, look at either operating it or developing it if it's not an operation. But in some cases, that's also leads to us making strategic investments in other companies that are currently the owners of a, of a project that we think has merit. Mm. And so we'll back them with financial and other support. Um, and in some cases, those are, are smaller investments uh, in terms of a percentage. But then we also have what we're calling our, our incubation model, where we have more uh, meaningful stakes in these companies and are providing uh, greater degrees of fin- financial and corporate support. So when you yeah, so when you say this incubation, that's that's an interesting term for the are now are these operating uh, mines or are these still in the stages of trying to get into production? Yeah, they would be exploration and development uh, assets that that uh, uh, probably need a bit more work in terms of exploration and and identifying uh, right. more in terms of the economics of them, and so that's why they fit better into an incubation model. Right. And, and just, just to kind of touch on it again, when you're saying it's not just financial, you're actually bringing in that, that corporate experience. Is it actual sort of hands-on support that you're providing as well? Uh, correct. Yeah. That's uh, looking at what are the right ways to run exploration programs, collect the data, uh, make sure that you're interpreting it right, uh, managing large complex programs, uh, ensuring that the company is structured and financed uh, adequately to be able to make it to the next uh, step in, in terms of the milestone. Um, you know, just sort of as we're getting to the tail end of this, when you're you're looking, I mean, you're you know, I, in all fairness, you're going to be a little bit little bit biased, and I I host a show, so I'm a mining show, so I'm probably biased too. But um, notwithstanding, what is your perspective on on just the investment in precious metals and how people are looking at the market, how people are looking at it, how it's being perceived, and how people should be looking at it. Well, I think uh, I think the, the market is definitely uh, waking up uh, and has been over the last couple of years to gold and now uh, silver investments. And uh, I, I think it's important to not lose track of the fact that that mining uh, should be like another business. So it, it's it's all great to point and, and get excited about um, uh, uh, geological world class deposits, but. But I think the, the real focus should be on, does this look like it has the, 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 the factors that could be a profitable business? And you know what we've done is we've been uh, successful both in terms of exploration, so uh, both internally and externally delivering on projects that um, have uh, delivered uh, attractive resources and reserves. And then we have a track record of taking them into production profitably. Do you sort of, as as a company, you know, uh, you sort of look at these, you know, this data of of how you compare how your performance has been to, you know, sort of your peers in the industry. Do you, can you sort of highlight how you, if you do that, um, how you perceive the silver core performance? Well, not perceive it. I mean, there's numbers out there that <laughs> can be very accurate. Sort of where where silver corp lands in that comparison of 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 your peers. Well, I, I think I think we rec- we uh, represent a a great investment opportunity to get exposure to that uh, silver sector in particular, uh, from a from a valuation standpoint. Um, we uh, we compare favorably to our peers. Uh, we have uh, growth opportunities both internally and outside of the company. And uh, the other thing we are doing is is uh, generating and have a track record of generating um, uh, profits and positive cash flow at uh, higher silver prices, but also at lower silver prices. So uh, we do provide a, a bit of a, a backstop uh, in, in case uh, things uh, do soften again. Uh, some of these other companies that have been high flyers will uh, definitely suffer more than, uh, than we will. And I, I think from that standpoint, you know, we, we uh, represent a great entry point for people looking to get exposure uh, to silver in particular. What is the, what have you learned? You know, you've been in the industry. I saw your bio, uh, I think 25 years, you come from, you know, the capital markets and finance background. Um, what have you learned, you know, just professionally and personally, um, you know, being in the position you have with, with silver corp, um, just, just in a, as a general, you know, seeing, seeing the growth of the company, seeing their strategies, you know, obviously you bring a lot to the table as well, but what is the less, some of the lessons you've taken away or even things that have surprised you about, about you know, what has been successful in the operation? Well, I, I think the thing that, uh, that we often see, and especially in, in some of these more robust mining markets, is I think uh, people fall in love with a hot story. 
and, and often will ignore some of the, uh, the important economic fundamentals is, okay, well, this looks exciting, but you know, can this really be a good business? And yeah. I think people, sometimes people lose focus on that. And uh, what's important is to not get caught up in, uh, in, that, uh, in that excitement and ignore those, those important factors, like can you get this operation uh, into production? So that this beautiful geology, these beautiful results that you've delivered, right. uh, based on the geology, the mining, the metallurgy, you know, can you get the product to market profitably and put money in the bank? And I think that, um, you know, that's that's an important thing not to lose uh, lose focus on. Do you think um, not doing that? I, I... I understand the temp- temptation, especially if you're like, let's say, a junior miner who's really trying to get you know eyeballs on your on your operation. Do you think though that I I see that you know money will be going to things like like tech and now you've got cryptocurrencies and like all these things that are sort of competing for that you know the sparkly the sparkly investment for lack of a better word. Um, and do you think mining really does need to to f- sort of focus in on what you're talking about, which is that, you know, core value? Is it a good business? Do they have cash flow? Are they carrying heavy debt? You know, these core values are what make a good business. I- is that where the strength of mining needs to be? Well, I think there are people that always look at it in that way. And, um, and those are people that, you know, might miss some of the outperformance when people are just chasing the shiny as, as you describe it. Uh, but then at some point, I think there's a reversion to the mean and, and uh, people recognize that some of these, uh, some of these hot stories really do have challenges and it's time to go back and look at, well, what really can deliver, um, you know, profitable operations, profitable, you know, metal into a market that, uh, that is, you know, savable for it. So I think, it, you know, you, you talked about uh, tech and cryptocurrencies. If you look at uh, the dot-com boom, there were companies that did have a viable business model yeah. and have made a lot of money, and those were the ones that were the winners. There's a, there's a lot of uh, obviously a lot of uh, uh, lost companies that failed uh, through that process. Yeah. Well, I will say, um, you know, I don't come on this show and pretend to be an expert. I interview experts, um, but I will say that this is long-form content, and uh, it says something, I know something about the company right away when they agree to say, no, you don't, there's no time limit. You don't have to be 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Just come on here and have a discussion. It says something right there about the company. So thank you, Lon, for coming on the show. Um, you know, I hope we get to chat again. Um, CIM is coming back to Vancouver. So maybe we'll get a chance to meet in person. That'll be, uh, that'll be a great thing to be doing again. Um, but I really do appreciate you walking through this. And uh, I hope I could ask questions that could set up some of it's some real context of what Silver Corp is doing because it's it's very interesting. No, that's great, uh, Jared. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks very much for the uh, for your time today. Okay, Gowdy. Hello again. <laughs> you know, again, some of these shows I need to like I need a degree to be able to ask 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 more uh, intelligent <laughs> questions. <laughs> it's um. You need more time. I need more time. More time. We should have like a three hour show. A oh, three hour. <laughs> don't don't speak that into existence because i it can I, happen i latch on to ideas <laughs> aggressively <laughs> um gowdy where can people like follow subscribe share comment suggest and a whole bunch of other things that they can do well first off subscribe to our youtube channel so you don't miss a single episode of mining now or any of our other shows like the crownsman show crownsman energy crownsman egg um I'm not missing one, am I? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, and follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can also contact us, info at crownsman.com. If you would like to be on one of the shows or know someone that should be on the show mm. um, and you'd like to recommend them, yeah, absolutely contact us. And change itself. We don't we don't host that show, but we do help produce we it. We do help produce. Wow. And See, they're I doing I was a, forgetting someone. They're doing a uh, Gus and Eric on change itself. They, those are fun to listen to. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're really, uh, I've noticed the last few episodes, especially they've been uh, the last one, especially actually they they're hitting their stride. Now they seem very comfortable and oh, like yeah. the, the, the conversation is flowing. Slow. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very good stuff. Thank you again for silver Corp, uh medals for being on the show and law and lawn shaver. Um, thank you to CIM for helping us put mining now together. We could not do it without you. It's absolutely fantastic. 
They've got lots of events. Go to CIM.org. Yep. Lots of events coming up. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you on the next episode of Mining Now.